Good evening, everybody. Welcome to church. It's great to see you all and welcome on the live stream as well. Please hear these words from Psalm 37 before we get started. The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Though he may stumble, he will not fall. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. We're going to start this evening by lifting our voices to our Lord in praise and um, we can sing, which is fantastic. Please leave your masks on, um, but please join us as we lift our voices to him. Please stand. Lord, help us to 
be people who trust and hope in you. Help us to be people who wait on the promises of your goodness. For you, O oh Lord, are faithful. May we be people of your peace and your goodness in this world. Amen. Please grab a seat. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Lisa. I am one of the pastoral staff here at St. John's in Asheville, uh, which makes up uh, one of the three sites of Christchurch in the West here at uh, Ashfield and also at St. Oswald and Haverfield and St. Albans and Five Dock. And it's a real uh, joy to be gathered here this evening and, yeah, really lovely to be with you all. A special welcome if you are new or visiting us this evening. Uh, we're really uh, glad you were able to come along. Uh, if you are new and you'd like to know a bit more about uh, getting involved in our church or what uh, being a part of our church might look like for you, um, there is a QR code at the front of your service sheet. If you can give that a scan uh, and fill in the details on a web website, uh, it will just get uh, one of the pastoral staff uh, to get in touch with you sometime this week and we can um, help you to work out what church um, here at Ashville uh, looks like and how you might be connected in with it. Also, welcome if you are joining us on the live stream. Uh, it's wonderful that uh, we can be God's people um, and that you are just as much a, a part of who we are here in the building um, as well as online. So it's really wonderful uh, to join with you this evening as well. Uh, a few little things. One, you might have noticed, um, if you are not new this week, that we have a new service uh, outlines and branding, which is really exciting. Um, there's been a lot of hard work um, gone into this. Um, and we don't just do branding to make things look pretty, which is always lovely, but also so that um, people in our community are able to more clearly know who we are um, and what we're on about here um, at Christchurch in the West. And so um, it's really wonderful to see uh, this new branding. And um, if you see our postcards on the way out, um, you'll see a little bit more of what that will look like. Uh, and we're going to have a new website and lots of things. And so uh, it's just really exciting to be able to um, connect with the community in a new and different way uh, through our branding. Uh, also, just letting you know that uh, this evening we're going to be sharing in the Lord's Supper together. Um, and Bridget will give us a bit more information later on about how that's all going to work. Uh, and we're also going to be continuing our series in the Psalms of the Ascent. Uh, we are in a season of uh, the church calendar of Advent, leading up to the birth of Jesus. And as we uh, sit and wait in this period of waiting for Christmas, we also are reminded that we are people who are waiting for Jesus' return. And we're going to be uh, continuing our series in the Psalms at the Ascent, uh, and Miles is going to be uh, sharing uh, from the Word, from the Bible this evening. Um, and so that's going to be really a wonderful time together. But why don't you take a moment to say hello to those who are around you. Um, maybe if there's someone new, make sure you say hello and, um, yeah, say hi. Hello, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. All right, all right, we're going to gather back together again. Everyone always loves talking to each other so much. Awful. Terrible. 
Okay, we're going to continue in our service together. Uh, Richard is my name. Uh, I'm the site pastor here at St. John's. Uh, I've seen the ministries here at this. Uh, one of those three sites that uh, Louise mentioned, uh, Make Up Christchurch in the West. Uh, let me add my welcome to Louise's. Great to have you with us, uh, especially if you're uh, new or newish here with us. Great to have you if you're joining us online as well. Um, I'm going to let you know just a few things going on uh, in the life of our community together. Uh, firstly, just a reminder uh, that this Saturday night is a jazz in the graveyard. Now, this is a a cool thing. We haven't been able to do it for a while because stupid COVID has ruined everything. Uh, but it's back. We're on again for Jazz in the Graveyard Saturday night, 7.30, uh, out here in uh, the cemetery. Uh, and uh, basically, it's just a way for us to uh, open up our space and our site, this beautiful piece of land that the Lord has gifted to us, uh, to those around us in our community as well. Often heaps and heaps of people uh, from around the local community who aren't members of our church kind of come and just get to see the space and be here and, and learn a little bit about us, actually, with the kinds of people who like jazz, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so it should be a really great night. I'd love for you to come along and love for you to invite perhaps some friends or some people you know who live around the area as well uh, and pray that it'll be a moment of uh, connecting with the community for us. Uh, lots of other connecting with the community things happening uh, as we uh, come up to Christmas as well. And so you'll see as you leave uh, the room tonight uh, on your left hand left hand side as you walk out, uh, a table with a whole bunch of packs of postcards on it. Uh, if you're someone who has been part of our Adopt a Block program, delivering postcards to the, the area around our, our church here, we'd love you to pick those up tonight. In those bundles, you'll find uh, these beautiful postcards uh, dev- uh, designed by the one and only guest speaker. She's done a great job. Uh, which are advertising our Christmas uh, services on one side and our kids' Christmas carols that we're doing uh, are running on from base camp uh, as well. We'd love you to grab those and to get them down to the boxes as soon as you can. Uh, just a way, uh, again, for us to invite the community around us to come and join us, to get to know us, and we hope and pray to meet Jesus uh, as they celebrate Christmas together with us this year. So we'd love you to grab those soon. And you'll see in your uh, service sheets as well, which I have in front of me, which is silly, but there should be a list of saved the dates there to you with all of our Christmas uh, things in there as well. And so if you haven't already, uh, make sure you have a look at the things that are coming up uh, and think about uh, what it is that you might uh, be along uh, to this year and perhaps who you might invite along uh, and be praying that program as well, as we've said, will be uh, an opportunity for uh, the community around us to connect uh, with us and to hear uh, the good news of the Lord Jesus this Christmas time. Uh, the only other thing to uh, mention, uh, as Louisa mentioned, we're sharing the Lord's Supper together this evening. This uh, meal the Lord himself has given to his people to remember his body and blood given for us, uh, all that he's won for us in the cross uh, and in his resurrection. Now, it doesn't matter if you're uh, here for the first time or not, if you're a regular member of our congregation or not, if you belong, uh, belong to Lord Jesus, if you're part of his family, then you belong at his table together with him. And so we'd love uh, for you to share in that meal with us tonight. Uh, we do it in a particular way. Um, those of you who've been around for a while know how it works. And so if you're not quite sure what to do, uh, you can just follow someone in front of you. Uh, we'll come up the side here and grab yourself a little grape juice or wine uh, up to the rail at the front. Uh, and uh, I'll come along and invite you, uh, give you and invite you to uh, eat bread and remember Jesus' body. Uh, Louisa will uh, come along and invite you to drink and remember Jesus' blood shed for you. But again, if you don't know uh, how it works, uh, follow the person in front of you uh, and you'll see how it works for us. So I want to invite you to join us as the Lord's people in this moment this evening. Uh, that's all uh, from uh, me in terms of notices. And we're going to hear from God's word in just a moment. And before we do that, we're going to pray uh, another one of those Advent prayers I mentioned last week. There's some beautiful prayers uh, set for praying through this Advent season. And one of them actually is a prayer to God for work in our hearts as his word is read and taught. Uh, and so we're going to uh, pray the prayer that you'll see in the service sheet, prayer for the second Sunday in Advent. Would you join me in praying this prayer together? Faithful God, you caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Help us so to hear them, to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that encouraged and comforted by your holy word, we may embrace and always hold firmly to the joyful hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Fon's going to read the Bible for us. There are three Bible readings tonight, two Psalms and then a reading from the New Testament. <clears throat> the two Psalms will do as a call and response. So I'll read the verse or two, and then you, the congregation, will uh, read some verses as well. So if you have your service sheets, the Psalm one two, uh, 129 and 130, um, you'll read the parts in bulk. I think the words are also on the screen, so you can follow on the screen as well. Psalm 129. Often have they attacked me from my youth. But Israel now say, often have they attacked me from my youth, yet they have not prevailed against me. The plowers plowed on my back, they made their fire.
sorrows long. The Lord is righteous. He has cut the cords of the wicked. May all who hate Zion be put to shame and turned backward. Let them be like the grass on the housetops that withers before it grows up, with which reapers do not fill their hands or binders of sheaves their arms, while those who pass by do not say, The blessing of the Lord be upon you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love. And with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. Uh, The New Testament reading is from Romans uh, chapter 8, starting at verse 18. Uh, Romans 8, chapter, uh, verse 18. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will attain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labour pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Miles and uh, I'm part of the 6pm team here and it's a real privilege to uh, bring God's word to you tonight. I'd like you to start by picturing a scenario that I think we'll all be familiar with and just a warning, this may not bring back good memories. It's a single three word message, can we talk? It could be someone in a position of authority like a boss or a superior at work, or it could be a loved one, a partner, or a closest friend. Now, I consider myself a fairly level-headed, steady kind of guy, uh, but those three words can be fairly frightening to me, even when I'm feeling really good about everything that's going on. By default, I'll ask myself, what have I forgotten? What's gone disastrously wrong? Not, what have I done well? But after that message comes, there's actually another step. There's a space of time between receiving the message and having that conversation. Sometimes it can feel like a very long time. I doubt uh, that it's just me who does this, but what I'll do is I'll play that conversation out in my head. I'll picture the place, the time, the opening lines, how the conversation is going to pan out. I'll, I'll, I'll have the whole conversation in my head in kind of three different ways or more. Um, And usually I'll be imagining that conversation going pretty badly. What's happening there is my imagination is driving my fear. Um, Although I also have the capacity to let imagination drive away the fear. Sometimes that just takes a little bit of work. Advertisers also actually understand the power of imagination probably better than anyone else. I'm going to show you um, two ads here. Um, But I'll start with a bad ad first. I don't know if you can see that very well. This is a a Samsung ad, and it doesn't take a genius. It's a clever line, and it's a dig at Apple, um, which is kind of fun. But at its core, this ad is just a list of features. On the left, you've got the comparatively small list of iPhone features. On the right, Samsung. Glorious Samsung. Um, That is what they call a propositional ad, which does just this, it lists a bunch of features. 
no matter um, how good they might be or how low the Black, Black Friday prices might go, propositional ads are not very good. Here is a good ad, and this is a newer one, so it may not be quite fair. The reason this is a great ad is because it actually doesn't tell you anything about how good the camera is. Clearly, the iPhone 13 is trying to tell you it's, it's phone based on the camera. You're meant to buy the iPhone not because of its amazing camera, but because the kind of life you live when you have an iPhone 13 is the creative, fun, vibrant life that has room to shoot home movies when you feel like doing that kind of thing. A good ad like this gets you to imagine a life and a lifestyle. Just dream what your life will be like with this product in your hand. We're in our second week of Advent today, and that actually gives us a common chord with the psalmists who wrote Psalms 129 and 30, and actually with all the writers and readers of the Old Testament. That common chord is that we're in a period of waiting. Um, for the psalmists who uh, could have been writing from the time of Nehemiah or, or earlier, we don't actually know, um, but uh, they have uh, spent lots of time into the power of a vivid and creative imagination that will fill us with the confidence to wait for Jesus' return, not only this Advent, but also for the years and decades to come. So we'll hear first about the two great threats to a well-weighted life, sin and suffering, and then we're going to take a look at how um, imagination, how the role of imagination can help us um, in these problems. So let's start with suffering. Uh, suffering really is one of the backdrops of human experience, isn't it? It's one that we all need to come to terms with. It's one that we need to realise and handle, something that we'll all experience. And that's actually the first thing to say about suffering, and that's the first thing the Psalms say to us about suffering, is that it is real. It hurts, it is universal, and that being real about suffering is an incredibly important thing to do. There's a bit of a myth out there that um, I think is worth being aware of, and it's a myth that perpetual happiness, the absence of suffering, is like a standard to be achieved. I think that comes from the idea as well that we've made it as a world, that medical advances and moral standards have written to such, risen to such a point that suffering has basically ended, at least here in the Western world. But thinking of the absence of suffering as a standard to achieve uh, does lead us to a few horrible conclusions. On the one hand, we can deny the existence of, of suffering when a close friend or someone we know is going through suffering. And that leads us to say things like, it's in your head, or it's just a short-term thing. And for someone in a position of deep suffering, there could hardly be any more harmful words. On the other hand, Denying uh, the existence of suffering or devaluing its existence can lead us to thinking of suffering as a curiosity or a problem, problem to be solved. To say that suffering should not be devalues the experience of suffering itself. But here how Psalms 129 and 30 not only acknowledge but dignify suffering. 
from 129, they have attacked me from my youth. The plow is plowed on my back. They have made their furrows long. And from Psalm 130, out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. These are psalms to be sung as a group. These are words to be said, and that is an acknowledgement and dignification of suffering. A second thing to say about suffering as well is uh, to notice the way that suffering lowers our eyes and makes us bad waiters for the Lord. Uh, and I'd like to share a personal experience first, actually, and partly as, as, as it's somewhat trivial, but I think it might resonate with a lot of people here tonight. Uh, it's about the last two years. I think here in Australia, we have been relatively unaffected by the crazy worldwide pandemic that's been going on. And yet, it has been a real experience of how suffering has lowered my eyes. Through lockdown, I've been an impatient person. I've been more addicted to my phone than I ever have been. I've found myself expecting enthusiasm about the return to church and instead battling tiredness and even disinterest. I've been unwilling to read my Bible I've struggled to know what to bring before God and instead have just uttered short platonic prayers. The experience of COVID hasn't made me long for Jesus' return more. It's just made me more apathetic. I wonder if you share some of that experience with me. And to be honest, that doesn't even compare to what's being described in Psalm 129. The plowers plowed on my back they made their furrows long. Just to give a little context, a plough is just a sharp, a single sharp blade that's designed to cut, cut those deep trenches, or the furrows, into which you put the seeds to grow. Deep trenches. It's a pretty graphic description. The way that suffering lowers our eyes away from Jesus' return is a real and deadly threat. Um, this is something we need to be aware of, and it's something that we battle each and every day. It's also a battle that the psalmist of Psalm 130 is, is, is facing. But notice how, even within the psalm, he actually works through it. He begins to work through it by reminding himself again and again and again to watch for the Lord. More than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the morning. It's not a typo that it's in there twice. I think there's another way that suffering can turn us into poor waiters. What I've described is what you might call despair um, or its cousin apathy. But suffering can also lead to something else in us that you might call over-eagerness or an over-responsibility that makes us unwilling to wait for the Lord. I wonder if there's a temptation for us to sometimes take things into our own hands, assuming God's position as master over suffering as the one with a plan to make all things new. But notice how the psalmist describes himself as a watchman. There's a sense of activity about the role of watchman, but there's equally a sense of inactivity about the role of a watchman. It's a task, but it's limited. It's a call to wait, to watch, and to trust in the boundaries of a city to protect the people inside. It is the Lord who has great power to redeem, and so our role isn't to assume his responsibility. And before uh, we move on to how sin lowers our eyes, I think there's one more point to say here, which is maybe to jump a little bit ahead, but I think um, there is a capability that we have to prepare for suffering through imagination. Many of us in this room will have experienced profound suffering before and won't, won't need to use their imagination but many of us will have only scratched the surface of, of the experience of suffering. And to those who are in that boat, I think that the Psalms offer us a window into preparing for that. The hard times will come, and being real about that is one thing, uh, but being prepared for that is another. And so it is a real skill to be unsurprised when suffering arrives. Um, it does never come in on our own timelines or our own schedules, but being real with suffering means preparing our hearts for unsurprise when it does arrive. 
What do you need to do to make the reality of suffering a non-surprise when that happens? So if suffering has the capacity to lower our eyes and make us bad waiters by leading us into despair and apathy on the one hand or over-eagerness on the other, what uh, can the Psalms tell us today about how sin has the capacity to lower our eyes? First thing to say is that there is actually there's a connection here. It's complex and nuanced and um, it's a little tricky there's a dual thread running through the scriptures between sin and suffering. Um, as we read, the nation of Israel suffers at the hands of the nations around them and leads them into exile. But it's also at their own hands, and that's something that God says through his prophets repeatedly and over the centuries. It's Israel's sin that leads them into exile. There's also an interesting irony between the two Psalms that's worth noticing before we uh, get further into this point. In Psalm 129, the psalmist is calling for justice and retribution upon the sinner, upon those opposed to God and his ways. In verse 5, he calls for the oppressor's actions to stop. In verse 6, he wants their efforts against God to be like grass trying to grow out of the mud that's used for rooftops, just withering away. And in verse 7, he calls for the sinner's exile and excommunication. But in Psalm 130, the psalmist is not calling for justice upon the sinner, but for mercy on the sinner. And the sinner in this case is the writer of Psalm 130. Now, let's return to this idea of sin and waiting, how sin lowers our eyes. Notice how in verses 1 and 2 of Psalm 130, the poet uh, doesn't actually specify the nature of the depths that they're in. They just say the depths. I think it's tempting to read that as if it was like uh, the King David from a cave pressed in on all sides by oppressors and pursuers. But the psalmist is not in that situation. The psalmist is wallowing in the depths of their own sin. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. And we know that because he continues in verse 3 by talking of iniquities, which is just another word for sin, uh, and forgiveness, not rescuing from external oppression. Drowned in guilt and shame, the psalmist is desperate for God simply to hear his cries. Much like its counterpart, suffering, sin can drive us into despair, or in this case, shame, and into over-eagerness. In this case, something maybe more like denial. Let's start with despair. I'm going to borrow here from Tim Keller, who himself borrowed from an author called Franz Kafka. And what Kafka and Keller both noticed, actually, is the partnership of guilt and shame as an essential pair in the Christian life. If I know something is wrong with me, but I can't actually point to any wrongdoing, I'm simply left in the depths. That's shame without guilt. Shame without guilt leaves us burnt, it leaves us hopeless, it leaves us fearful of engaging with God himself. In the context of a life spent waiting for the Lord, it can shrivel our fates, it can lower our eyes, It can leave us not looking forward to the future, but fearful of what is to come. The psalmist deeply understands not only his shame, but his guilt before God. Out of the depths, he cries. He has profound agony and a profound awareness of his weakness before a holy God. Another reaction to our sin is to take the other approach, denial. That's when we tell ourselves that our sin is something that we can manage on our own or that it doesn't exist at all. We can hide sin, uh, not only from people around us, but we can hide sin from ourselves, actually. The Bible tells us of our ability to deceive ourselves. It's something we're very, very capable of. And the thing is, the more we deny our wrongdoings externally, the more we pass over and ignore our fallibilities as fallibilities and weaknesses, the less we become aware of them. 
That's the thing about sin. It doesn't even feel like sin half the time. We're so good at making ourselves feel like there is no wrong when there really are things to deal with. It's not that significant. It's not hurting anyone. It's just temporary, we'll tell ourselves. Sin can drive us deeper into despair and shame or denial. Both are great enemies that stop us waiting from the Lord. As we begin to move out of these ideas, notice as well how the psalmist imagines God in Psalm 130. And isn't it interesting how he doesn't describe God's forgiveness and mercy first. He actually imagines the inverse. He imagines what it would be like if God did mark our iniquities, if he did watch for our failings and our disobediences. Which, to start with, his approach is actually a clue about what the way forward is going to be. So we'll come back to that in a sec. But first, it, it is interesting to think about this hypothetical, isn't it? What if God did mark our iniquities? And it's not very hard to imagine, is it? Because we are very good at marking iniquities ourselves. We're good at noting who the bad people are. We're good at notching our weaknesses on someone's personal score in our minds. We're good at looking out for those petty little things, letting them stay in our view of someone's character. And inversely, we're, we're also really bad at changing our labels for people who we might have already deemed wrong in the past. We're horrible in our imaginations for how God might grow and change someone. But what the psalmist says God isn't, that's exactly who we are. It's important to sit in this hypothetical just for a little bit because it's important to not just realise um, but really actually know and let this dwell in our hearts because answer the question, indeed, who could stand before God? Who could stand before God if he marked our sins down one by one? Who could hold up to his standards? So we move on to point three. See, the psalmist was using metaphors when he imagined the enemy ploughing along his back. Jesus did not have to use his imagination when he was whipped to the bone before his crucifixion. There was nothing metaphorical about his suffering, nothing in his imagination. And what did he do? He waited. He waited in patience despite the incredible agony he was going through. He waited in love knowing that it wasn't even his sin that brought him where he was. Where does that leave us? How, how does that change our hearts? What God's word has for us today is, is through the Psalms to engage our imaginations, to help us wait for the coming of the Lord despite both sin and suffering that we've talked about. Jesus was left in unimaginable, unimaginable pain so we could imagine perfect, full, life-changing forgiveness so that we can see, even if it is just like a reflection for now, what true forgiveness and right relationship with God, what everything may, being made new would be like, even before our own sinful nature is finally gone. Somewhat incredibly, it is already December, and I had a look at my calendar the other day to realise that I have two free nights between December 1 and December 25 which uh, is not many, and there are probably people in the room who tell me I'm lucky to have any free nights uh, before Christmas. Work to do, people to see, events to organise, sermons to prepare, or one sermon to prepare, work deadlines to hit, and I doubt I'm alone in suggesting that the busyness of this particular month can get quite overwhelming. But here's what I've been doing. I've been imagining Boxing Day, 10.59 a.m., feet up on the couch, I've got a large homemade flat white in my hand, and Pat Cummins, the glorious, newly crowned Australian cricket captain, is about to start steaming in from the members' end at the MCG, and the English openers are trembling in their boots. And on top of that, there's the relief of no more deadlines, no more things to organise, no, uh, nothing more to do, just time abundant, activities to joy, enjoy and people to enjoy them with. It's my imagination that's keeping me going this December. I wonder if you're doing the same as me. 
And this is the thing. This is actually the approach that the psalmists are modeling to us today. In Psalm 129, the Lord is righteous. He has cut the cords of the wicked. Beaten and run down, the evil plowman is hacking into his back when the Lord comes in and breaks the cords of his tools, of his plows, and suddenly all pain is gone. He's not only confident that the Lord will save, he can visualize it. And the only way that we can persevere through suffering is with that kind of firm confidence and assurance that's so vivid it's like an imagination. Remember how the psalmist in Psalm 130 describes his job, like a watchman in the night. Like a watchman in the night. This is an activity for our minds, for our souls, a repetition again and again. But like we heard before, uh, the task of being a watchman is actually a kind of non-acting that's only possible because of our confidence in the coming dawn. There's one beautiful part of Psalm 130 that helps us here as well. As we wait in full, eager expectation of the Lord's return this Advent, we watch. And this word watch is actually the same word used in verse 3 as Mark. We watch for the Lord. He does not watch for our sin. As we pull things together, what might this really mean for us this Advent as we enter a period of intense focus and a special time of reflection and of waiting? And I'd like to challenge us to engage our imaginations over the coming few weeks. Many of us will have heard every carol, every Christmas story, every, seen every image of the birth of the baby Jesus. There's a repetition that can admittedly drive us crazy. Shopping centres, bus ads, even here at church and on TV. Christmas is everywhere. But there is a way that we can use this season to fill ourselves up for the journey ahead. Not only this Advent, but for the year to come and, and beyond. As you see and hear and sing of a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, will you imagine an even better sight? A king wrapped in purple robes, triumphant over all enemies, triumphant over death. As Jesus' story begins in this world, will you imagine how it ends? Sitting on the throne in full fulfillment of everything that was said and with those who trust in him, singing, worthy is the lamb who was slain. That is the kind of vivid, life-changing, soul-filling imagination that God has given us to use. That is fuel for the months and years and decades to come. It's the picture above our mental mantelpiece. Our hope as we wait for Jesus to return and make all things new. Can you imagine that? Let's pray. Lord, our Heavenly Father and loving Redeemer, we praise you for your grace to us. We praise you for your patience. We are so thankful that you do not mark down our sins in a book, that you send your son Jesus to die for us and bear everything we deserved. Lord, please fill us up this Advent as we wait for your return here on earth. Fill our minds and our hearts with the images of things to come. Help us hold on to this sustaining hope and help us carry out as Christ's faithful followers until the end. Amen. Let's now lift our voices to our Lord God and praise him for the grace that he flows on us.
loves of Christ my Lord. As we stand together, uh, we're going to declare with one another uh, the words of the Nicene Creed. Uh, these are words that have been uh, spoken uh, by Christians for generations, and it is a declaration of who our God is, who that we believe in, uh, and so as we uh, have heard so much about the God that we know and love, who has uh, poured out his grace in us, let us declare what we believe. Together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, universal, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please grab a seat. Uh, we're moving into a time of coming before our God in prayer. Uh, so let us join together uh, in the words which you can find on uh, this insert in your service sheet uh, under the heading of a prayer of preparation. Uh, so let us uh, prepare our hearts as we come before our Father in prayer. Together let's pray these words. Almighty God, you know our hearts and nothing can be hidden from you. By your Holy Spirit, cleanse our thoughts and desires so that we may truly love you and bring honour to your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Uh, we believe that as we uh, pray be to our God, uh, that we can bring before him anything that is on our hearts and in our minds. Um, and Claire's going to lead us particularly in uh, bringing before God the things uh, that are happening in our church and in our world at the moment. Um, so she's going to come lead us in prayer. Join with me as we pray to our Father. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are a God of great power, power to save, power to redeem, power to change, and also a great powerful love. We thank you that in your power you have enabled us to grow close to you. You have created this world and created people in it, and even when we walked away, you, you reached out with your power across the universe through your Son, to enable us to come back to you. We thank you so much for the ways you have worked in this world and in our lives. And we thank you particularly for the way that you have saved us. We pray for our broken world at the moment, as we've done so frequently over the last two years. We pray for the COVID situation. We thank you so much for the wisdom that you have given to doctors and to governments and to individuals in responding to this disease. We thank you that the worst strains of the virus are starting to fade in a lot of countries and that vaccination rates are going up. As uh, rates of the more serious strains lessen in Australia, help to us to keep on our hearts and minds and in our prayers, those in countries where this is not the case. Um, we pray for those in countries where cases of Delta and other serious strains of COVID are still raging. Um, we pray that you will keep the life, loss of life to a minimum and that you'll give governments wisdom in responding to this 
and to making ac taking actions that will enable the saving of lives. We pray for those countries where the Omicron virus, a version of the virus, has emerged. We thank you that it appears this is not as deadly a virus. Um, we pray that you will stem the tide of this as well, because even, even just the emergence of this variant, even if it is less deadly, is meaning that people are still stuck in foreign countries and unable to travel. We pray that ultimately you'll bring an end to this violence, uh, not violence, uh, this disease, and you'll bring um, a, a situation where more and more people are able to come back to a version of ordinary life. We thank you so much for the relaxing of restrictions here in Australia, and we pray that that continues and that more and more we are able to see family and friends and enjoy the things in life that we love without having to think about safety as much as we did to have these last two years. We pray for the rollout of the booster shots, that this will go well and that people will be wise in taking action in this case. And we also pray for us as a community and for Christians around the world that they will not be divided by the divisions that are arising around the world and when it comes to people talking about the vaccine and there will be still people who open and love all pe uh, who are open and loving to all people regardless of their stance on particular things. In a more positive note, we thank you that we live in a country where elections are free and fair and democracy is a thing that occurs. We thank you for the local government elections that occurred across New South Wales yesterday. We thank you so much for what will be, I assume, a smooth transition of power in all places. We thank you for those who have been elected to the governments um, that impact the local government areas in which um, the churches of CCIW fall, for the councillors and mayors elected in Canada Bay and the Inner West. We pray that whether they follow you or not, you will give them wisdom to lead in a way that is compassionate and wise and looks to the needs of all people, but particularly those who are less fortunate. We pray that whether our, the party we prefer got into power or not, that we will look to our leaders to lead us well and see the power of local government for changing the good things it does in society. We also thank you for education and we thank you for the end of another school year and university year coming up. We pray for those students who still have exams and assignments due. We pray that you will enable them to work diligently on these. We thank you that those students who have struggled through two COVID years for year 11 and year 12 are now done with the HSC. And we pray that you will give them patience um, while they wait for their results. We pray for university Christian groups as they finish up the year, um, that you will give them good messages to send home to students, messages that speak of you. And we particularly pray for events like the National Training Event, which has been occurring over the last few weeks. We pray that you'll use this event, even though it's in a changed state to previously, to powerfully change the lives of university students in this country. We pray for school Christian groups and for youth groups that they also will be able to be empowered to send high school students off into the school holidays with the powerful message of your love and what this se upcoming season means. Um, we particularly lift up to you the kids' church groups and the attic here at St John's and the broader CCIW, that you will empower us, those who lead, um, to really um, end this year well and give strength and patience to those last few weeks as the school year ends. We thank you for all the upcoming events here at CCIW, for jazz both here at St John's next Saturday and at St Albans next Sunday. We pray in this first event that is a big community event since COVID that um, you'll bring many from this community to both jazz events and that they'll be able to interact well with the people from CCIW that they meet there. We pray that you'll use these events to start opening doors to the gospel in the hearts of people who don't know you in this area. But also that you'll use these events to remind the people of this area how much the church communities of CCIW love them and want to uphold and share your love with them. We pray for base camp. We know that it has been a difficult time recruiting leaders, but that leaders have been recruited and that kids have started signing up. We pray that 
even though there may not be as many leaders as there have been in previous years, that you will still use this program to powerfully change the lives of the children who attend. That there will be children coming both from church families and from church families outside the church, the church and we powerfully pray that you will enable those from non-church families, not just for this to impact the children, but to impact the parents who may not know you. We thank you for the upcoming Christmas services and pray that again, this will be a great opportunity for members of the community to come onto the properties of CCIW and hear about your gospel and hear about the season of Christmas. In this season of hope and joy, we pray particularly for those who were baptized this morning at various CCIW sites. We pray for Remy and Clover who were baptized here this morning. We thank you that you've led Ben and Ali to commit their children in this way to being raised within the church. And we pray that we, as a church here at St. John's, will be able to really support Ali and Ben as they seek to do this and really be people who get around Remy and Clover as they grow up. We pray for Tugs and Zeke over at Haberfield and thank you for the commitments that they have made as adults to following you and to declaring their love for you in front of a broader church community. We really pray that you'll continue to strengthen them and to enable the community of Haberfield folk to really support them well and to help them grow more and more as followers of you. During this season of waiting in Advent, we pray that you'll enable us to wait hopefully, to imagine powerfully, and to imagine a world where the baby who was born at Christmas will once again return in power to save us. And we pray this in his name. Amen. We're going to just join together now in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, so don't think it's in your um, service sheet, sorry, but uh, let us pray that together. Uh, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Uh, we're going to come now into a time of uh, confession where we uh, have been reminded this evening about uh, the ways in which uh, if we stood before God and he marked every iniquity, who could stand? Um, and it is by uh, the grace of God that we can uh, be free from sin um, and, to, and that he uh, grants us his grace. Uh, but we know that uh, as followers of Christ that we don't always live uh, in line uh, with the ways that he has commanded us to. And so uh, we can come before him uh, humbly uh, in confession and know uh, that he hears us and that he will pour out his grace on us again. Uh, so let us uh, join together in uh, the words of the confession, which is in that same uh, insert in your service sheet. Let us pray. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you made all things, and you call everyone to account. With shame we confess the sins we have committed against you in thought, word, and deed. We rightly deserve your condemnation. We turn from our sins and are truly sorry for them. They are a burden we cannot bear. Have mercy on us, most merciful Father, for the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Forgive us all that is past. Enable us to serve and please you in newness of life, to your honour and glory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Just as we heard before from Psalm 130, it says, If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. It is our God who has poured out his grace upon us and his mercy, and we can be sure that if we come before him in humble confession, that we stand before him as his children right in his eyes, um, and that we can be confident in uh, his son and all that he has done for us on the cross to take away our sin and shame. As Just before uh, we now move into a time of getting ready for the Lord's Supper, uh, we're going to uh, share with each other the words of the Green of Peace uh, as a way of uh, sharing with one another uh, a piece of encouragement. 
Uh, and I think the words are going to come up on the screen. Or they're also in, that's fine, sorry, they're in your service sheet too. Okay. We are the body of Christ. His spirit is with us. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And now as an expression of peace, um, say peace be with you to those who are sitting around you. You're welcome to stand up and say peace be with you to those around you. Brothers and sisters, let's uh, gather back together again as we come to share uh, in this moment of the Lord's Supper together. Uh, on that insert that we've been working through uh, with uh, the details for today's gathering, you'll find uh, the uh, preparation for the Lord's Supper, and we're going to share in those words that you'll find there. Sisters and brothers, lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Let's continue in prayer. All glory and honour, thanks and praise be given to you at all times and in all places. Lord, Holy Father, true and living God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is your eternal word, through whom you have created all things from the beginning and formed us in your own image. In him the day of our deliverance has dawned. We rejoice that through him you make all things new and we look for his coming in power and majesty to judge the world. In your great love, you gave him to be made man for us and to share our common life. In obedience to your will, your son, our Saviour, offered himself as a perfect sacrifice and died upon the cross for our redemption. Through him, you have freed us from the slavery of sin and reconciled us to yourself, our God and Father. He is our great high priest, whom you raised from death and exalted to your right hand on high, where he ever lives to intercede for us. Through him you have sent upon us your holy and life-giving spirit and made us a royal priesthood called to serve you forever. Our Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup. And again, giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these gifts of bread and wine and pray that we who eat and drink them, believing our Saviour's word, may share in his body and blood. Dear brothers and sisters, come let us take this holy sacrament of the body and blood of Christ in remembrance that he died for us and feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Amen.
you take that uh, insert in your service sheet again, uh, we're at uh, the point titled After the Lord's Supper. Let's pray. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace, and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. May we who drink his cup bring life to others. May we whom the Spirit lights give light to the world together. Keep us in this hope that we have grasped, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name. Father, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. We're going to stand and lift our voices, our hearts in song and praise again to God as we sing this song of committing ourselves to do what it is that we've just prayed, to give our lives to follow him. Let's stand and sing together.
to bring to God in prayer and you'd like to do that with someone, uh, someone will be just down the front here in a few moments' time. We'd love for you to come and uh, share with them what's on your heart and together bring it to the Lord. But now let's go out with the blessing that you'll see uh, on your insert, the dismissal. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to know, love, and serve the Lord Jesus Christ, His church, and His world in the power of the Holy Spirit to the glory of God the Father.